The antebellum southern planter usually lived their life in the upper middle class. In 1860, a typical farm in a slave state was worth $140,000 today, while those in free states were comparatively worth $67,000 today. Planters generally had most of the economic power in the South. Southern planters and their families often lived in plantation homes that were spacious and comfortable. The average slave owner was more than five times as wealthy as the average northerner, and more than ten times as wealthy as the average non-slaveholding southerner. Many planters relied on slaves as the workforce to handle and care for their crops and households. In the South, 385,000 people, including planters, owned approximately 3 million slaves. In the state of Louisiana, a state abundant with slaves, planters were some of the wealthiest in the South. These planters made their living by harvesting from plantations branching out from the Mississippi River. Some Louisiana planters learned to buy and sell goods and slaves at the best prices and then inject the profits back into their plantations. Many Southern planters also married. As part of the Southern Code of Honor, marriages were often important because members of the planter class intermarried, had children, and then passed down successful plantations and their slaves to the children. The marriage of a planter's daughter was important as the planter can establish or re-establish a family claim and can also make a class claim to the land by attending the wedding. Women assumed the responsibilities of providing children and working in the plantation home. The southern planters also spent time engaging in leisure activities and entertainment. In the south, gambling was an exciting pastime. Gambling was initially reserved for the social elite, but over time it spread to the entire planter class. Gambling worked especially well for the planter class as most could afford to gamble from the profits made on their plantations. Men could make isolated wagers on events such as cockfights, steamboat races, horse races, and even just the turn of a cart. Horse races were particularly favored by the upper class. Steamboat races were popular but were blamed for boiler explosions and other river disasters as a result of straining the boats too much. Many activities were designed for informally held public wagering. A large aspect of gambling involved playing cards. Some favorite card games were poker, pharaoh, 21, and old sledge. In the card games, tens and thousands of dollars could be wagered, won and lost in a single evening. Card games became so popular that gambling rooms with gaming tables appeared in hotels, clubs, and coffee houses. There were also professional gamblers, who, as social outcasts at the time, tended to stray from gambling rooms. They were sharp-witted and sometimes reckless gamblers. Few of them relied on their luck and skill and used methods of cheating such as palming and marking cards, dealing seconds, and using holdouts, poker rings, strip decks, and many other devices. These professionals were talented at establishing riverboat gambling as a recognized institution. Music was also a popular way to spend one's free time. Harpsichords, violins, and recorders were the instruments of choice in the 19th century. Most Americans would go to concert halls to hear European compositions, but there were some composers from the South that brought listeners, the most famous being Louis Moreau Gottschalk. In New Orleans, entertainment could be found easily. One could go see regular opera productions, balls, concerts, and even traveling shows. There was high activity throughout the city, even on Sundays, in high contrast with a quiet Sabbath. New Orleans offered a wider variety of entertainment and liveliness that contrasted with the quieter, easy-paced life found in other areas of the South. In the South, there was a Southern Code of Honor. Dueling was necessary to defend one's honor, even if it meant death. Two men of the same social rank would challenge each other. A duel would take place with either a pistol draw or a match of fencing. Sometimes a duel was challenged on behalf of political party affiliations. Throughout the South, planters played a vital part in life, and thus were the first to fall when the antebellum world began to collapse.